All right, so we'll get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marianne Fozel. I'm a professor in ECE, and I'm here to introduce uh, today's speaker, who is also a faculty member in our own department, uh, Professor Lillian Ratliff. Uh, so she's an ass uh, assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at UW. Uh, she also has adjunct uh, faculty positions in the Allen School for Computer Science and Engineering. Um, she received her PhD in EECS from Berkeley in uh, 2015 and also did a postdoctoral uh, research uh, position uh, at Berkeley for a year before uh, joining us here at, at UW. And she has a uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in both EE and uh, in math from University of Nevada in Las Vegas. Um, Lily's research interests lie at the intersection of game theory, learning, and optimization. And uh, she basically, her work draws on theory from these areas to develop tools for studying algorithms and algorithmic competitions, cooperation, collusion, and tools uh, that she uses for designing algorithms uh, with uh, analysis and performance guarantees. Um, so uh, she has won a series of awards as well, including the NSF Career Award in 2019, the ONR Young Investigator Award in 2020, the NSF Size Research Initiation Award in 2017, and uh, she also recently was awarded the Donani Endowed Faculty Fellowship in our department in, in 2020. So uh, I would also like to uh, say a couple words about the seminar series. So Lily is also the organizer of this quarter uh, series of talks on this topic of games and learning and optimization. And there's a sequence of uh, really amazing speakers that are lined up. So hopefully you will learn a lot more about this topic throughout these talks. Um, so without further ado, I'll uh, let Lily take over and tell us about Beyond Open Loop Thinking, Prelude to Learning Based Intelligence Systems. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm just going to just apologize because of the way that my screen is viewed, but I can't full share. So you'll just have to see the stuff around the edge. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing uh, in my group on learning based intelligent systems. And so, okay, so I like to start with just a little bit of um, uh, like putting things in context. Uh, and so you can imagine just for a moment that you're going to go to a uh, online uh, marketplace like Amazon to order, say, some cat treats for your furry little friend. So, what you do is you go and you search uh, in the platform for the items that you're looking for and you engage with a ranking or pricing algorithm that determines what to present to you and sort of what prices to set these, um, these items at based on say uh, other, um, other, like based on uh, multiple sellers and based on your past preferences and so on. So you place your order and then it gets passed along to a distribution and routing phase where some optimization and resource allocation um, algorithms determine a warehouse that has the item that's uh, in close proximity to you and can be delivered in a timely manner. And then your order gets passed along to say a courier market where some matching algorithm determines which courier should take um, you know, your product to your order to, to your home. And then this courier navigates to, uh, let's say the curb in front of your, your house and maybe engages in a curbside market such as an auction or a pricing um, algorithm to procure some space. So this is actually something we're working on currently in my group, design of these sort of flex zones or curbside markets. So then you, uh, you have your cat consume this product and then uh, you give some feedback in the form of product review, thereby closing this sort of loop. And so in this market ecosystem, if you will, there's various different algorithms that either you're engaging with directly or are working in the background to uh, you know, enhance your service or facilitate the service that you're, um, that you're getting. And uh, each of these algorithms uh, are producing outputs, which are then being fed into sort of the next phase. So there's a sort of a fundamental interconnection amongst all of these algorithms in this, this market ecosystem. And so while this uh, seems to work really well um, in practice, I mean, uh, markets that we engage with all the time, they're one of the sort of uh, fundamental intelligent systems that seem to work uh, really well. But underlying, uh, we see that there's often many challenges that arise or unintended consequences that can emerge. So these are some examples. So in 2010, there was this flash crash 
uh, in the uh, stock market. There's been many of them, but this is one of the more significant ones because we lost uh, billions and billions of dollars in a matter of like 30 seconds. And this was attributed to the fact that there were algorithms interacting with each other in a really fast, uh, like high, high time scale or very fast time scale. And it sort of uh, went uh, unchecked uh, and it happened so quickly that it, um, we lost money uh, very rapidly. Another example, which is maybe a little bit more familiar, is this whole phenomenon or whole um, fiasco, if you will, for, with GameStop. Um, so <clears throat> this is sort of an example where we have small players that are uh, able to enter the market due to uh, new digitally mediated platforms sort of at the edge. So meaning on your uh, cell phones, uh, such as Robinhood or eToro and um, amongst uh, many options that are there. And so the play, these small players sort of observed a, a weakness uh, in the market structure. So essentially hedge funds were uh, shorting on predictable stocks like GameStop, assuming that it was going to continue to degree, decrease in value. And these small players were able to exploit that, uh, you know, which is great for them. Uh, and this resulted in extreme volatility and it's still going on. So this is a, actually a snapshot from like earlier. I think this is uh, sort of where my mouse is, assuming you can see that. Uh, this is like early in January, and then when I took a clip shot of this, it was already spiking up again in February, and then I don't know if you just pay attention at all to Reddit, you'll see that there's still ongoing uh, back and forth about uh, GameStop, amongst, uh, GameStop stock, amongst others, um, that uh, people are sort of playing this game with. And so the point here is that there's these sort of unintended consequences uh, from having um, algorithms and digitally mediated platforms that we engage with that are sort of facilitating uh, important services. Now, if we think back again to that uh, sort of vignette at the beginning, and we, and, you know, from the perspective of a sort of uh, research, um, from the from sort of a research perspective, we think about training any one of those algorithms. Uh, let's take this, uh, so curbside auction or something like this. So basically, the way this occurs um, in modern day machine learning is that we have sort of this sort of training phase where maybe we have um, some meta learning algorithm even that's training some uh, complex neural network and that's doing so in a very highly non-convex uh, optimization landscape, then the output of this is perhaps passed along to an evaluation phase, which is a common thing to do now where you pit algorithms against each other in so-called test suites. So one model of this is as a network uh, game. And so then you have these really uh, complex dynamics that emerge from these algorithms interacting. So you can have things behaviors such as cycling or even chaos, things that we don't quite understand very well that are occurring. And then based on some evaluation criteria, usually some heuristic, we select an algorithm and then it gets deployed in practice. And then importantly, that algorithm changes sort of the underlying distribution, which we're then going to use to train our algorithm sort of in a, a feedback loop. So we get this sort of feedback induced distributional shift. Um, and so to deal with this, I'll argue that um, we really need um, to draw on tools from a variety of different domains. Uh, and so, for instance, we really need uh, game theory and economics to capture sort of strategic interactions and be able to design mechanisms for shaping behaviors. Uh, we need recent and promising uh, advances in algorithms and computation to scale up these uh, mechanisms that we design and deploy them in the real world. And we need statistics and optimization and control uh, to capture uncertainties and dynamics. And so over the last uh, several decades, we've seen the emergence of se several important subfields that try to draw on uh, subsets of these areas. So machine learning is an example, algorithmic game theory, uh, and so on. And so <clears throat> this seminar series, let me see, okay. So this seminar series is actually bringing together an important set of people who are working, uh, at, you know, they have their sort of expertise in one of these core areas, but they're working either around this sort of circle or across the circle to develop um, new tools uh, for uh, addressing this issue of designing algorithms, designing solutions for intelligent systems. And so um, I've sort of selected these people in uh, very purposefully. So we have people with back background and control that are working in game theory and in learning. We have people in statistics and optimization that are now working in economics. Uh, and we have people from the, the largely from the computer science or algorithmic algorithms background that are now um, using things like uh, control and dynamical systems to analyze uh, algorithms. 
So I'm very excited about this um, whole really new research agenda and uh, this seminar series. And so I'd like to sort of kick it off by talking about the work in my group, which is really sort of focused at the confluence of all of these areas. And so in today's talk, what I'd like to really focus on is this one of these issues that I highlighted in the previous slide about this sort of feedback induced distributional shifts. And so what I'll argue is that we can um, leverage tools from control and game theory, along with uh, learning and decision making to really formulate um, um, algorithms with provable convergence guarantees to game theoretically meaningful equilibria, things that are interpretable, as well as practical solutions that can be uh, deployed in practice. Okay, so I wanna start by um, sort of posing this sort of uh, central tenant that classical machine learning has been based on and then sort of question whether that actually holds in the, these intelligent systems like the sort of vignette at the beginning or like any of the examples pictured here at the, at the bottom of the slide. So the central tenet is, is the following. So when it's arduous to model a real world phenomena, uh, observations thereof are representative samples from some perhaps unknown uh, static or otherwise independent distribution. Um, so let me sort of focus on two challenges related to intelligent systems that sort of question whether this tenant holds. So the first is that supervised algorithms uh, tend to be trained on past data without considering that the output of the algorithm may actually change the data distribution. So see an example of this. This is a very important problem. And uh, I hope that more attention is brought to this, this problem. Um, and it, you know, it's been uh, studied now for some time, but I think now is a good time to sort of revisit this uh, as scientists. And so uh, basically what you see on the slide is this issue of predictive policing using apps. And this is a, uh, some results of a study um, published in the Royal Statistical Society. Um, uh, it's cited here at the bottom from 2016. And basically what, is it, what these guys did in their study is they looked at drug arrest in the sort of uh, East Bay area. So if you look at the plot at the top uh, left of your uh, screen, there's, these are drug arrest in 2010 in the Bay Area. And so you can see they're sort of concentrated in uh, this sort of West Oakland area. And then along this, this strip, which is kind of like where Fremont is. And these are places uh, that are um, uh, predominantly pe persons of color live in these, these locations. But then if you look in the bottom plot on the left, you see that this is estimated drug use from a 2011 national survey. <laughs> and basically everybody uses drugs. So um, yeah, it's not concentrated in any particular area. So what these guys did is they use PredPol, which is a, uh, an existing algorithm uh, by uh, one company purporting to do predictive policing. Um, and they used it to do day ahead predictions of hotspots uh, that can be then given to police. And then the police uh, decide where to go and you know, arrest people or whatever for using drugs um, based on these predictions. And so there's, uh, these are simulations, but um, nonetheless, based on their simulations, they showed that what would happen is if you, um, uh, if you use this pred poll to predict hotspots, and then you go and you collect data, or, or you go and you arrest people in that area, and then you keep training your algorithm based on that arrest data, then essentially you're just reinforcing these institutional biases. Um, and that's obviously a negative, uh, negative thing. And so, um, yes, uh, this is sort of highlighting that we need to take into consideration when we're training our algorithms, sort of where our data is coming from, what sort of biases it has, and then the fact that our actions are actually, the actions based on the, that data are from, uh, you know, predicted by our algorithms uh, are going to influence the data that we collect. Okay, so a second issue is that many of the algorithms we train are based on data generated by strategic sources such as humans. And to see this, you can consider the following example. So in 2019, uh, it was reported that Uber drivers were actually um, increasing, uh, or sorry, trying to trigger uh, surge pricing by decre artificially decreasing the supply. So they would turn off their phones um, in key locations, like around airports, in order to make the supply go down or seem to go down. And then they would uh, see that the surge price would go up and they'd turn it back on. And they were doing this because they felt unfairly treated uh, by uh, it's not just Uber, but Uber and Lyft drivers were, were caught doing this. I just have pictures of Uber here. Um, <clears throat> because they were, felt like they weren't being paid enough by, by Uber. But in fact, what they ended up doing 
is uh, causing these uh, search prices to trigger. And then all of that pr extra pricing gets offloaded on the other side of the market. So there's these sort of negative uh, unintended consequences as a result of this sort of strategic behavior. And Uber, um, they gave a sort of press release about this and they said that one of the things that's difficult is detecting when this is happening in a strategic way versus like naturally. So at airports, you naturally see sort of uh, more like more um, uh, volatility in the supply anyway. And so it's hard to determine whether that was strategically induced or not. All right. So in today's talk with those, those examples in mind, I would like to um, describe some of the work that we're doing in uh, going beyond this view of uh, just minimizing a loss function uh, for the purpose of training uh, or designing algorithms uh, and start thinking about how we can leverage game theoretic abstractions to uh, capture issues like I described. So this distributional shift, uh, either from decision dependent or strategic data. And so towards that goal, I'll first take a step back um, and uh, describe some of the work that we've done on giving provable guarantees uh, for first, or first order methods, uh, ensuring that they actually prove to game theoretically meaningful or interpretable solutions. And as far as I know, this is the first, we'll give the, I'll describe the first global convergence guarantee, in particular, the first global finite time convergence guarantee for uh, min-max problems. Um, and then after doing that, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of our very preliminary work on taking a sort of small step toward, uh, forward towards addressing this issue of learning with decision dependent data. Um, okay. So let's start with just a simple uh, abstraction, uh, not a simple abstraction, but that, the abstraction that we'll use uh, throughout the rest of this talk. So basically we have a learner, which we're gonna abstract as uh, this set of parameters theta. So this will be like the parameters theta that we're gonna choose that sort of determine our uh, algorithm, whatever it is, our learning algorithm. And the way that we choose this is that we wanna minimize a loss function, which depends on this parameter theta, but also some data uh, Z. And this data Z is uh, drawn from a decision dependent distribution. So this underlying distribution um, that describes sort of how Z behaves is actually dependent on theta. Uh, in addition to this, we also wanna capture that maybe our model of how this distribution depends on theta can be uh, misspecified in some way. So we're gonna allow for um, this uh, distribution to sort of vary in a, a larger class of distributions. Uh, d theta here. Then uh, the overall goal is to sort of uh, solve this optimization problem. Uh, so minimize this uh, whole uh, object here. So this sort of worst case expected loss, um, <clears throat> uh, given that we're trying to like choose these parameters theta. So this might seem uh, like a new thing, but it's really not. This is actually just uh, the marrying of two existing uh, paradigms. So if we forget about distributional robustness, then basically what we're left with is just a uh, optimization problem where we have decision dependent probabilities. And this has been studied in the classical uh, operations research literature. And then more recently, uh, we've seen um, this problem sort of rediscovered in machine learning under the name performative prediction. So this is largely motivated by strategic classification. Uh, so where you want to solve some classification problem, but the data that you're, you're doing this for is generated by um, strategic users. And uh, people have recently leveraged new advances in convex optimization to address uh, that problem. On the other side of the coin, if we forget about the decision dependent data, then all we're left with is a distributionally robust optimization problem, which is also extremely well studied. Um, there's a, a recent survey that I cited here that has, um, is quite extensive if uh, folks are interested. And so basically what we're doing is we're going to put these two things together. We're going to see that this is sort of fundamentally a min-max problem. And then we're going to leverage uh, not just game theoretic tools, but also tools from control uh, and dynamical systems in order to design more efficient uh, um, algorithms as well as uh, handle this decision dependent data. All right, so let me start with the first part of the talk, which is, uh, as I said, taking a little step back to try to understand something a little bit fun more fundamental about uh, min-max problems. So in particular, uh, these min-max problems are sort of emerging as a fundamental tool, not just in the, the abstraction that I described before, 
But even in uh, other areas of machine learning, including uh, adversarial learning, hyperparameter tuning, and so, and so on. And so the, the point is that these game theoretic abstractions, such as min-max, actually lend a sort of new perspective on how to view uh, robust machine learning. And they also naturally sort of model this um, strategically generated data or distributional shifts. And so the challenge here is that there's a significant gap between what works in theory and, and what works in practice. Uh, and so to date, we don't know uh, of uh, convergence guarantees for first order methods, which are the reason we want first order methods is they're scalable uh, to uh, meaningful and interpretable solutions. So I'm gonna talk about how we can close this gap. So first we need the abstraction that we use. So we're going to uh, model um, or consider the situation in which we have a sufficiently smooth cost function F that defines a zero sum game and correspondingly a min max optimization problem as shown in these boxes on the left. So the first player is minimizing with respect to x1 and the second player is maximizing with respect to x2. And the most natural uh, learning dynamics in this setting when you have sufficiently smooth cost functions is gradient descent ascent. And so the one difference maybe from what you've seen before and what I'm describing is that we're gonna allow the, the, each player to have their own step size. And this induces a time scale separation. Uh, which we capture through this parameter tau, which without loss of generality, we're just taking to be the ratio of gamma two to gamma one. And so in, uh, from the theoretical point of view, what we know uh, with regards to getting provable convergence to uh, game theoretically meaningful equilibria is that we require second order information. Uh, and this can be computationally prohibitive. So uh, however, in practice, People have shown that if you just use this heuristic of introducing time scale separation, which you can think about as a proxy unrolling the inner player a few steps, uh, something of this nature, this is really effective. Uh, people have shown that this works extremely well uh, for um, adversarial learning and even in, in reinforcement learning. So as I said, we're gonna uh, talk about closing this gap between theory and practice. So let me start with what is known for these uh, update rules. So this, um, when there's no time scale separation, as you see on the left here uh, in this sort of uh, graphic, uh, what we know is that you can have spurious stable points of these dynamics or this learning dynamics that are not game theoretically meaningful. So this sort of blue region outside the red region. And then you can also have game theoretically meaningful points. So these strict local min max, which are um, not <clears throat> uh, stable for the dynamics. So this red region outside the blue region. If you, on the other hand, take tau to infinity, then um, you get this infinity GDA uh, as is pictured in, on the right. And essentially you can show that, or it was shown recently by Chi Jin and uh, Pranith Netrapali and Mike Jordan that uh, <clears throat> uh, the set of strict local minmax coincide with the locally stable attractors. However, taking tau to infinity, this time scale separation to infinity essentially leads to a numerically intractable or, or numerical issues in the implementation. You're basically causing uh, your uh, problem to be highly ill-conditioned. So we want to fill in this middle regime here. And in particular, what I'm going to show is that we can get a non-asymptotic construction for this finite time scale separation parameter such that you still get this guarantee of all, the only stable points being strict local min-max, so things that we, we want to converge to. And the way that uh, we're going to show this result is actually leveraging some classical tools from control theory and dynamical systems. So when you're talking about learning in games, uh, you can't just think about, and in particular, when you're talking about gradient play, you can't just think about the, the dynamics as a gradient flow because uh, they're not. Each of the players is updating their own individual um, uh, cost function with respect to their own individual uh, gradient. So it's more natural to view this as a dynamical system. And so on the left, we have this time scale separated gradient descent ascent dynamics where there's two key parameters. Gamma one is the step size and tau is this time scale separation. And so we want to separate the effects of these two on uh, the convergence guarantees that we can get. So to do that, we take gamma one in the limit to zero. So then we can just get this continuous time dynamical system on the right. And we can study, it only depends now on, on tau. And we can study the stability properties of this dynamical system uh, and then go back to the discrete time system through uh, a discretization. So I won't talk about that part because that's, you can just leverage standard numerical analysis tools for that. And I'll focus more on the new insights that we have about this continuous time dynamical system. And to study 
stability properties of this continuous time dynamical system, we essentially look at critical points. So where this map G that has the individual gradients is zero. And we look at the local linearization around those points. So <clears throat> we need to now define what it means to be game theoretically meaningful. What types of equilibria do we care about? And so the ones that we care about are these local Stackelberg or uh, min-max points, which are defined in this top box. And I've written this in this optimization way on purpose. So there's the usual inequality definitions that maybe you're more familiar with, but I've written it as this optimization uh, problem because we can see by looking at um, sufficient conditions for optimality for each of these problems, we essentially get a nice mapping between stable points and uh, these uh, game theoretically meaningful points. So just uh, taking a step back, what this definition says at the top is that player one is playing a best response, taking into consideration that player two is playing a, a best response in turn. So it's, it's being a little more than myopic. So thinking ahead sort of one step of what the other player is going to do. The second player is simply just playing a myopic best response, which is typical. Uh, you might have seen this in the best response definition of MASH. Um, and so um, at the bottom in the left, we have essentially this object, which is known as the game Jacobian. So it's the local linearization around critical points of that continuous time dynamical system. And this local linearization, this game Jacobian has all of the important curvature information uh, rele uh, relevant for um, the st understanding stability of critical points and for defining uh, the sufficient conditions for this meaning, this notion of um, equilibrium that we care about. And that's what you see in the, the bottom right block, which is this definition of a differential Stackelberg equilibrium or strict local minmax. And essentially, it's a point that's a critical point um, and such that the sure complement of the game Jacobian is positive definite. So that's the second order sufficient conditions for the first player. Uh, and the last condition is that the second player is at a, a local max. So we want that red block to be positive definite. All right. So now I said I was going to close this gap between theory and practice uh, with regards to uh, coming up with this finite construction, uh, non asymptotic construction of a finite value of time scale separation. So let me first describe, to give some intuition for how we do that, let me describe how it's done in the asymptotic case. So essentially, what happens is that uh, the spectrum of this game Jacobian splits into two pieces uh, asymptotically as the time scale separation goes to infinity. In particular, one part tends towards uh, the uh, spectrum of the sh uh, sure complement of the game Jacobian, which defines one of the conditions for that uh, strict local minmax. And the other part uh, tends towards a linearly scaled version of the individual Hessian of the second player, which defines the, the second uh, set of uh, second order conditions uh, for this uh, strict local minmax. So we get this sort of asymptotic splitting of the, the spectrum. And to argue that we don't need to look in the asymptotic limit, you can take this little example at the bottom. So we have a quadratic game defined between two players uh, where zero, zero is the strict local minmax. And then the right, we have this um, eigenvalue plot. So in dynamical systems, a point, a critical point will be stable if all of the eigenvalues are in the open left half plane. So that's the shaded blue region. And what you're seeing is that as we scale tau, I'm drawing out traces of what these, where these eigenvalues are in the uh, complex plane. And they enter into the open left half plane when you see that star appear. So that's when tau equals two. And then um, this happens like well before the asymptotic splitting, which is occurring when you see those eigenvalues hit that real line and split and go in opposite directions. So this gives some intuition for why well, we should be uh, way we should expect we can do this finite uh, or non asymptotic construction. So I won't go into the details, but I'll just give you the result. <clears throat> so essentially, what we can show is that for any critical points, there always is this uh, lower bound on the time scale separation. So that point will be stable for all larger values of tau if and only if it's a strict local minmax. That gives us a provable uh, local convergence guarantee, um, saying that really we, we can only. Um, you know, obtain the strict local minmax if we appropriately scale uh, time. Moreover, we can come up with a non-asymptotic construction for this value of tau um, <clears throat> simply by solving an eigenvalue problem. The way we do that is with this really cool uh, old tool from uh, control theory. It's very obscure. I think the paper we found it in was cited one time, uh, but now it's cited several times uh, since we've sort of brought it to light. 
basically this thing is called a guard map and it just gives you a it's a polynomial that gives acts as a um, sort of certificate for when your eigenvalues enter in the open left half plane as you scale tau. So we construct this guard map or polynomial, then we decompose it uh, till we end up with just this one little piece here, which is an eigenvalue problem in tau, where this matrix B only depends on those block components of that game Jacobian. So again, just highlighting how important that game Jacobian is. Turns out that our construction is tight and we can uh, you know, manipulate this polynomial even further to get a really efficient computation of tau star here, this lower bound on time scale separation. Okay, so why is this important? How do we use this? Um, and so what I'll argue is that it's really important for several classes of, um, of uh, games because we can analyze tau for not just at critical points, but for the entire class of games, meaning that we can give, uh, for example, uh, these global convergence guarantees that I alluded to at the beginning. So let's start with um, this first class. So generative adversarial networks are a type of adversarial learning problem where you have a generator that's sort of tasked with generating say images maybe of ducks as I have pictured here for you kids hard to see or cats or whatever um, <clears throat> and then you have a discriminator that's sort of trying to to fool it and uh, you train them together in order to ensure that your generator is robust to these sort of adversarially generated uh, examples um, <clears throat> And so for this class, there's something called the relaxed realizable assumption, which is the one set of assumptions we know on GANs or we have for GANs for which we have uh, theoretical guarantees. And what this means is basically the generator can reproduce the underlying data distribution. And for this class, we can basically show our lower bound on timescale separation is equal to zero. And so that means you can choose any timescale separation and you're gonna get these local convergence guarantees. And so from a practical point of view, what this does is it says that um, we can actually implement um, uh, a stochastic timescale separated gradient descent ascent, which is, you know, typically we use the stochastic gradient descent ascent to train uh, GANs. And we can do so in a, uh, under a relaxed set of uh, assumptions and still get provable guarantees. So in particular, uh, the theoretical, from theoretical side of things, to, in order to get convergence, uh, you typically need two um, time scale uh, stochastic approximation where you have two learning rates that have these sort of asymptotic relationship with one another. And so if you try to implement that for GANs, basically what happens is you end up equilibrating too fast or you get other numerical problems. So it just doesn't work. So our results are just saying, okay, you only need one of those learning rate schedules and then you can just pick a time scale separation and you're still gonna get all the same convergence guarantees and it works well in practice. Okay. So then the second class of problems um, that these results impact, which I think is probably more uh, important is as follows. So basically many problems um, in machine learning that are being posed as min-max problems can be formulated as non-convex, uh, what's called mu PL games. And so essentially uh, this mu PL condition relaxes um, a concavity assumption on the, on the maximizing player. And what it basically means is that the gradient grows as a quadratic function of suboptimality. And the problems I've listed here at the bottom all can be formulated as these non-convex MUPL games, if not non-convex uh, concave games. Okay, and so for this class, we can give really strong guarantees. Basically what we can show is that you never have spurious, um, stable, non-game theoretically meaningful points. So you don't have that issue at all for this class. Moreover, for any point that is game theoretically meaningful, uh, we can uh, show that that point will be stable for all values of tau after the first time, uh, first value of tau for which it's stable. And that first value of tau for which it's stable always exists. Um, <clears throat> so in practice, what this means is you just pick a tau, whatever stable points you have for this class of uh, um, games in this, in this set of dynamics, they're all going to be uh, game theoretically meaningful. And as you scale tau uh, up or down, or as you scale tau up, uh, you're never going to introduce new spurious stable points. So basically you have a lot of flexibility in choosing tau in order to say, improve your uh, convergence rate or to ensure that you're going to particular equilibria that, um, that you would like to obtain. So <clears throat> we can use uh, this insight to actually get a global convergence guarantee 
um, which I haven't seen anything like this uh, in the literature so far. So I think it's the, the first of its nature. And essentially what we can sh show is that first, um, this time scale separated gradient descent ascent avoids saddles, uh, strict saddles almost surely. Uh, and we can construct a potential function. So that means you don't have limit cycles, which is another issue you have run into with uh, games, dynamics uh, for learning dynamics for games. So then putting these two things together, we can get a global convert asymptotic convergence guarantee to the set of strict local min-max almost surely uh, for this set of dynamics. If we specialize to the non-convex strongly concave setting, we can actually give a uh, finite time escape uh, of saddles uh, at the rate uh, described here at the bottom. So this uh, O tilde D epsilon minus four. And so this means we get um, a uh, global convergence guarantee to the set of epsilon strict local min max in finite time. Um, <clears throat> and so one interesting thing is that this rate, this uh, iteration complexity is almost matches what it is uh, the iteration complexity for stochastic non-convex optimization. The only difference is the factor of D there. We're pretty sure that that factor of D is um, has to be there as well. We haven't, uh, you know, proved that yet, but it doesn't seem that you can uh, get rid of it. So I think that's interesting. That factor of D is the dimension, by the way. If I didn't say that. Okay. Anyway, so uh, I think this uh, is a is a very interesting set of results in the sense that um, I haven't seen anything like this before. So it gives one of the first global convergence guarantees for games. Okay. So some takeaways. Um, essentially, what we have done is close the gap between uh, theory and practice, giving provable convergence to game theoretically meaningful points or interpretable points. Uh, and the way we do this is by exploiting the inherent game structure in the way that players interact. And so this leads to these sort of provable convergence guarantees for first order methods, which is ultimately important because we want to analyze more complex decision dependent min max problems like described at the beginning. And we want to do those things at, at scale. And so having second order methods is just not sufficient. All right. So then what I'd like to do, uh, as mentioned, is take a little step forward <clears throat> um, and show uh, what we've done so far on this decision-dependent, uh, learning with decision-dependent data. And so this is joint work with my colleague, Eric Marjumdar at uh, Berkeley and uh, some students, uh, Chin Mei, Frank, and Mitosh that we're working with. Uh, okay, so coming back to that abstraction from the beginning, we have this uh, distributionally robust decision dependent uh, problem, if you will. Uh, so essentially, we had this loss function that a learner is trying to optimize, uh, where uh, the underlying data distribution depends on theta, so the action that, or the learner uh, that the learner is taking. And we want to capture model misspecification uh, by allowing this distribution to vary in a larger class of distributions. And so uh, sort of what's important here is that this is a sort of min-max or Stackelberg game between the learner and these strategic data sources or the source of this distributional shift. Uh, and the applications are, are pretty far ranging as described at the beginning. So we have sort of this predictive policing uh, where the more data you're collecting in an area, the more likely you're see to see crime there. Uh, strategic classification, which I didn't really talk too much about, but this applies to things like, uh, you know, getting into college, loans, interest rates, and so on. And so users can uh, potentially strategically manip manipulate their features to be positively classified. And then the last sort of example, which I'll focus a little more on uh, in the rest of the slides, which is there's not too many, um, <clears throat> is uh, this rideshare example. So let's sort of go from a practical problem to this abstraction that I described, and I'll sort of build it up along the way. So suppose now that your, uh, so this, I didn't say this, but the, the Z here is actually gonna be composed of a set of features X and either a label or an outcome Y. And so let's suppose that these features, uh, which are going to be dependent on the uh, learner theta uh, are uh, reported by some set of users. And the, the way that they're reported is through uh, for example, some utility maximization. So they have some set of true features, which if we take this rideshare example, this might be a driver's true location or availability. Uh, and then um, essentially they determine what to report or what sort of data to release into the, the world that the learner gets to observe, which is what um, the, their sort of reported supply or reported location and availability. And this depends on, on theta. And so in addition to sort of this, we want to 
also capture in the way that we train data that this best response model might be wrong. So we might have a miss specification in, in this utility function or class of utility functions that are describing how X is generated, how XI is generated. Okay, so then uh, if we have this sort of way of thinking about how we uh, arrive at this distribution mu through generation of these XY pairs um, as a result of say strategic uh, data generation as described on the previous slide, then we can put this together uh, with a few additional structural assumptions in order to get a, a more solvable problem, if you will. And so <clears throat> the problem that we've been studying is this one described at the top, which is a Wasserstein decision dependent distributionally robust optimization problem. So I know a lot to say there, uh, WD3RO for short. And so we make the assumption that, um, that uh, sort of the class of uh, losses that we're gonna look at are going to be a generalized linear model. And we're going to allow this uh, distribution D of theta, uh, this, the class of distributions that we vary in to, to um, be defined by this uh, Wasserstein one distance between uh, mu of theta and the empirical distribution. So this is uh, the, the distribution estimated from the samples of data that we're getting uh, from um, say these strategic data sources. And so, <clears throat> Before going on to the results we have, it's, it's important to sort of understand what is uh, known for this problem in the case where uh, mu is not um, dependent on theta. So then in that case, you just basically get a Wasserstein uh, distributionally robust optimization problem. And under some nice regularity assumptions on your loss function, you can show that it can be reparameterized, uh, which is what was shown in this 2015 paper cited here in this second bullet. Um, this can be reparameterized as this min-max problem. And in fact, in that 2015 paper, they show that if you can go one step further uh, and uh, just write down a single optimization problem. But uh, along the sort of a theme of this, this talk, a very recent result actually by um, Eric uh, Marshumdar um, and some other students at um, Berkeley, they showed that you can actually just leave it in this min-max uh, form and exploit this min-max structure along with random reshuffling and proximal point methods to get super fast convergence. Like the, uh, yeah, it's, it's really impressive what they've done. So <clears throat> the point being that they sort of exploited the game theoretic abstraction instead of going to a single optimization problem and you can, you can gain from that. Okay, so um, we can leverage the same ideas and the same trick to reparameterize our problem um, in a similar form. So the one sort of caveat here is that uh, the data uh, x and y here are now dependent on theta. So it's not clear when this is a convex concave problem, which it was in the, in the previous case under you know, uh, some the same assumptions I mentioned about a generalized linear model and so on and so forth. Uh, this problem uh, in this slide is a convex concave optimization problem. When you have this decision dependent data is no longer necessarily convex concave, or we don't even know necessarily when it's solvable without putting some assumptions on how XI and Y are generated. So that's what we do. We actually combine this with another interesting recent result from uh, Dong et al in 2017, which basically is a study of strategic classification from a convex optimization perspective. And they show that if you have a user utility model as seen at the top here, that basically the best response is gonna be convex. That means how X is generated based on theta is a convex mapping. So if we have this uh, along with some additional assumptions on our uh, generalized linear model phi, then we can show that uh, this WD3RO problem is in fact still convex concave. And we can leverage the same, con same ideas about uh, combining proximal point with random reshuffling to get uh, fast local conversions. So I won't go into that. I'll just quickly talk about <clears throat> uh, some interesting insights that we've gotten from looking at real data. So we'll revisit this um, uh, Uber uh, example where agents are strategically turning on and off their uh, phones in order to cause uh, increases, decreases in supply, artificial decreases in supply and thereby increases in the uh, likelihood of a triggering a search. So I took this data from uh, this Washington Post uh, article, which is cited here at the bottom, where they were studying um, the effects of 
uh, or when how surge pricing is correlated with different socioeconomic indicators in the Washington DC area. I wish I had airport data, but unfortunately I don't. So I chose a set of um, uh, locations uh, from this data set that are near uh, sort of these metro stations here in um, DC. Uh, and then looked at a time window in which um, it is typical for people to be say going to work or using Uber, so eight to 10 in the morning. And I created a stylized model. And the goal here is just to see um, sort of how this strategic uh, manipulation of supply can impact uh, the quality of the learner that you, um, uh, you're trying to, to fit. And so the stylus model here is that we're gonna, in the data that, that is given, there's um, wait time, uh, estimated high and low price, uh, as well as whether they're like what the surge in, uh, multiplier is. And then in addition, I combine that with weather data uh, and um, yeah, combine those, those features with weather data to create this model. And so wait time I'll use as a proxy for supply and drivers here observe sort of the surge status and then they react by artificially causing a dip in supply. And dips in supply then trigger the surge price. And so we have these non-strategic features. So things that the agent can't, or these drivers are not manipulating. So weather, for example, and this estimated cost, upper and lower bound. And then the strategic feature, which is the wait time. So I'm assuming that you know, they're turning off and on their phone and then that's causing a dip in supply and then that's causing the wait time to increase. Okay, so then for this, uh, this setup, essentially what we do is we simulate the strategic behavior to see what the effects are. Um, <clears throat> and so I have this simple model for how agents manipulate uh, the wait time. So basically if uh, a surge is not triggered, then they will increase the wait time uh, according to this uh, utility, um, uh, this utility model and corresponding best response. So then what I do is I just solve the standard performative prediction problem which um, is, if you recall from earlier in the talk, this is essentially when you do not have um, the distributionally robust aspect. So you take into consideration reactions of the agent, but not model misspecification. So I train that. And then I also uh, ran some simulations for our setup where we actually leverage this timescale separation in addition to these, um, the random reshuffling and proximal point methods to get fast convergence. And so, um, this is as expected. So basically the plots you're seeing here is just um, illustrating that um, the solution is more robust uh, from our method is more robust than performative prediction. And so you can see this in, let's take the left plot, for example. So epsilon here is the, the size of perturbation that the agent um, is um, uh, uh, inducing on the wait time. And uh, delta is the size of the uh, ball around, that were uh, the Wasserstein ball around the empirical distribution. And then what I'm doing is I'm plotting for different values of uh, this epsilon and um, uh, delta. The, um, the uh, accuracy, how the accuracy degrades if you actually have a larger perturbation or a different size perturbation epsilon tilde as plotted on the x axis. And so just to, the only thing to see here is just that performative prediction is the dotted one and it very quickly, the accuracy degrades. Um, whereas, uh, you know, our solution uh, basically stays uh, roughly the same for some time and then uh, uh, finally degrades. Okay, so maybe more interestingly is the following. So I also looked at the false positive rate. So a false positive would be, uh, you know, triggering a surge price uh, when, um, when, yeah, when you shouldn't have. And so in this case, the negative outcome of this is that all of those false positives are going to end up offloading a lot of costs on the other side of the market, so onto the passengers. And so there's just sort of negative consequences all around. And so in the top, you see sort of how the false positive rate changes uh, for performative prediction, which does take into consideration agent manipulation, just not the robustness issue. And then on the bottom, you see the combination of the performative prediction with robustness. And importantly, um, the bottom plot, so our method actually, the false positive rate, it does increase, but it increases very slowly at a much lower rate than uh, what is happening in for performative prediction. So even the point is, even if you take into consideration the reaction of agents, if you have a bad model for their behavior, then you can still 
uh, have negative consequences if, um, yeah, if it turns out that your model is wrong. All right, so I'll just wrap up. I think I'm getting close out of time anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, so I want to sort of open this question up about what should be the right tenant, the sort of principle that we um, take into, in, into consideration when we're thinking about learning uh, learning-based intelligence systems. So I started the talk with the central tenant of classical machine learning and basically showed that that fails to hold in a lot of these modern um, uh, cases in which we want to deploy learning algorithms. And so I don't have an answer to this, but what I, I do want to highlight is that uh, it seems like game theoretic abstractions are really central um, and so the reason is that, you know, they, based on just the content that I'm presenting, and hopefully it's stuff you'll see throughout the rest of this uh, seminar series, uh, is that we get arguably leveraging these game theoretic abstractions, we get arguably more interpretable and obtainable equilibrium concepts with simpler learning algorithms, so first order methods that uh, provably converge much, much faster. For example, the results I mentioned uh, from you et al. Uh, from the, the uh, folks there at Berkeley, showing that you can leverage the min-max formulation to get really fast convergence. And we can leverage these game theoretic abstractions to capture sort of how the environment reacts, how uh, you know, strategic data is being generated or how the sort of decision dependence uh, arises and actually in a problem. So yeah, I don't have an answer for what the central tenet should be, but I think game theory plays a, a huge, should be playing a huge role in this. And so, <clears throat> Um, I'll just finish up in the last couple of slides. So I, I focused on one sort of complex uh, issue. Uh, so this feedback induced distributional uh, shift, but there's uh, a, no a number of interesting uh, problems. If you just think about this in general, how we train algorithms uh, in um, you know, this modern machine learning, if you will, uh, from like these highly non-convex landscapes to this algorithms interaction acting and uh, leading to complex dynamics. And this plays an important role coming back to the bigger picture at the beginning in like all different phases of uh, this even basic loop of getting cat treats from Amazon and having them delivered to your to your house. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, I really think that this is sort of highlighting that there's this really new domain that's emerging uh, that's at this sort of intersection of all of these uh, different fundamental areas. Uh, and so just to wrap up in the last slide, I'll say that you know, we're going to see some really exciting talks, which are also highlighting these things from uh, looking at, uh, you know, fundamental problems uh, in uh, min-max optimization, you know, to issues in designing control algorithms for large-scale uh, intelligent systems. Um, and next week, we'll hear from, specifically from uh, Mike Jordan, who will talk about his recent work at the intersection of statistics, uh, learning, and economics. Uh, and I'm very excited for the entire series. So I'll, with that, I'll just conclude. And if there's any questions in the last, like, I don't know, seven minutes or so, then uh, I'll be happy to, to answer those. Thank you very much, Lily, for a very interesting talk. Lots of different topics. Um, if anybody has questions, feel free to uh, unmute and ask at this point. I have actually one in the meantime. Um, actually, the robust, uh, distributionally robust version of the um, decision dependent problem. What's the condition for convexity when you have both the max over theta soup over the family of distributions, um, expectation over the distribution? Uh, sorry, hang on. What do you mean the condition for convexity? Is there a, a condition that would guarantee this is convex in theta when you have D of theta in there? Uh, not this one. In this case, in this case. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah no, so. Well, this one that is not. Uh, it, it is convex if Y doesn't depend on theta and X is uh, generated according to the Dong et al paper. So the, um, these assumptions on uh, how X is generated. And then in addition, if phi is not increasing in convex, then the composition of phi with the x will be um, convex. And then this problem overall is convex concave. And what if there is dependence on the theta? 
That's what I'm saying. In that case, when it depends on theta, it's convex. When x is generated in this way. Uh -huh. And what about y? No, yeah. Yeah, for when y is dependent on theta, I don't have any result for when. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. I see. I see. If x depends on on theta and it follows that best response, it yeah. is convex. But if y depends on theta, it's hard. Yeah, convex. I don't have. And even in the case, as you're probably aware, I, I sort of gloss over this. But um, this also, because you need this phi to be non-increasing and convex, you can't even take into consideration like the both positive and negative labels, as yeah. some of the work right. we're doing shows. Yeah. So, yeah, I glossed over that. But. Yeah. Right, right. So it's much more complicated in that case. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I see also now a question in the chat. Uh, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Where's the chat anyway? Or if not, I can read it. Yeah. The question is: In an early slide, you restricted tau to be bigger than one less than infinity, but later you seem to allow. Uh, a bigger range of tau. So uh, initially tau is bigger than one and later tau is just bigger than zero. So that's- Where is this? Early sides, I guess a time scale separation taus. Was there a tau bigger than one restriction early on? I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know where that is. In general, you didn't need- No, you don't need that. I mean, it might be the case that it's greater than one for certain classes. Uh, so for example, um, yeah, actually none of the classes I talked about are in that situation, both this non-convex PL and the uh, GANs with realizable assumption uh, don't require tau to be greater than one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure where, if, there, if there's a slide with that, it's probably a typo. So I, I don't know where that is, but uh, sorry. Thanks. Anyone else have questions? I have a quick uh, big picture question. Uh, is uh, ground truth data easy to obtain for such problems? For example, the, the Uber uh, colluding driver scenario? No, definitely, definitely not. Um, so you would actually need to, uh, to get this sort of strategically generated data, you need to like actually change your theta, probe say the world, and then collect that data based on the changed theta. So, Unless you created a situation like this, um, uh, maybe like, I don't know, using Mechanical Turk, or if you could convince a company to let you do that, it, it is quite difficult. I think it's much easier in, in the strategic classification problems because, um, uh, you know, you can maybe convince, I don't know, a university to change their admissions policies and then see what happens after that. Um, or, I don't know, you might be able to find uh, collaborations where that, that that is much easier. I don't think collaborating with Uber would um, that would ever happen, for instance, based on my own personal experience and trying to collaborate with companies. So, yeah, that is a yeah, it's a good point. It's very difficult to uh, create an experiment where you're actually probing the world and then seeing the change and then making a decision again based on that. Okay, any other questions? I see a question in the chat. Oh, that's the same one that was asked. So I, I would just say though about that. So we do have like past data where people have changed say theta in some way. Uh, and then we have data that is collected where those changes have been implemented. And so you can create simulations that are reasonable and believable. And I mean, sort of like I did. And then there's other, like in the original performative prediction papers, they have some nice um, experiments based on this give me credit data set, which is a, a data set for um, uh, lo like loan procurement. So whether or not a, a person is qualified for a loan. Um, so you can create realistic simulations. Okay. <clears throat> if there aren't any other questions, I guess we're close to 1130 now as well. So uh, we can wrap up and uh, I'm sure that uh, next uh, weeks, as Lily described, will be a set of very exciting talks continuing along the same topic. So hopefully you can all attend uh, and uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>